Marion, um, you are the director of the Trade and Agriculture Directorate at the um, OECD. Um, how would you say, what is the OECD? How would you describe it to somebody who doesn't, hasn't ever heard about OECD? Um, the OECD is an international organization of 38 members, and these members consider themselves to be like-minded. And that's an important um, element potentially of the discussion we are going to have that I think we'll touch on geoeconomics. What the um, countries have definitely in common is that they are all democracies. All democracies. You have worked for many international multilateral organizations. Um, you worked um, for the International Trade Center. You worked for the World Trade Organization, and you worked for the International Labour um, Organization. So you are a true multilateralist? Uh, well, I've become less multilateralist by moving from uh, Geneva to, um, to the OECD. Um, but yes, I'm a multilateralist. I uh, believe in multilateralism, and um, I'm lucky that also the current uh, management of the OECD and its members consider to believe in multilateralism, including in the, trade of fee in the field of trade that I'm, I'm leading. So strong support in our organization, uh, not only for working together as 38 members, but also at the World Trade Organization. One last question before we sit down. WTO seems to be a little bit different than the ILO and OECD as well. Um, and uh, do those work together, those organizations? Um, yes, the organizations do work together, and um, I can only uh, advise anybody who intends to work for IOs or is working there now to change employer from time to time. Mm. It's fascinating uh, to understand, to look at the world from different points of view uh, through um, different lenses. But uh, the important aspect is to always remember that the members of these organizations are often the same. It's only different ministries that are represented. Mm. And that's an aspect we live very closely in the OECD. Uh, the OECD, so that's maybe an additional aspect of that organization. We cover nearly every part of government with the exception of defense and culture. And that means that in the different directorates, we work through something called committees with different ministries. So I work with the trade ministries and with the agriculture ministries. Um, but I have colleagues who work with the ministries designing industrial policies. And I have colleagues who work with the finance ministries that look at industrial policy, for instance, with, from the point of view, how does this affect finance? Um, and this possibility to work across ministries and across countries within one organization, it's fascinating, in particular in current times. Oh, I am sure. Um, we are now going to sit down and talk content, but um, during the breaks, you also need to tell us a little bit more about different cultures of ministries and countries and how that works. Um, but, but please... So we talked a lot about trade yesterday um, and, um, and, and also this morning. And the discussions on trade have changed. Um, if we compare it four years ago to today, um, there seems to be much more of a security element um, in there, or maybe even five or six years ago. We talk more about um, French shoring, near shoring, reshoring. Um, we talk about export controls, investment screening. Um, the whole issue, and, and, and often trade is more seen as a liability than really a benefit in those discussions. And when we talk about the WTO, Oh, sorry to say that, but um, a lot of times I hear when somebody says I'm still a supporter, then people say, oh, you're so old school, <laughs> you are so naive. Um, times have moved on, or when we hear um, it's, uh, it's the end of change through trade, wandel durch handel, it has proved itself not relevant or not accurate. So the, the mood seems to have changed about uh, trade, and still trade seems to be important. Tell us a little bit about your thinking and also the OECD thinking of what smart trade policy in a different geoeconomic environment and geopolitical environment would look like or could look like. 
Um, we, we are very actively now looking into this question, what does uh, trade policy look like in this, um, in this new setting? But uh, maybe let me start with answering your question by um, going back to this question of why does trade look so bad? And I would make, like to make a link to the previous session and Piketty's book. Um, when you look at the reputation of globalization, how it has changed over the past 20, 30 years, the, the, the benefits of globalization have been questioned more and more. But what I find very interesting is that of the different elements of globalization, I think, for instance, migration, capital flows, and trade, it is sometimes in election campaigns, it's migration that is blamed, and it's trade that is blamed. Never capital flows. And a big change in 1990s and the early 2000s was the opening of capital market markets. Trade had been open before. And if you read Piketty's book, his answers lie in changing the things book? in the... I even lectured on it. Ooh. Um, the, change li, uh, the changes uh, he asked for lay in the capital markets and financial markets. Um, uh, that leads me to the OECD. Uh, I believe that the BEPS agreement, the agreement on baseline erosion and profit shifting that is, is in the taxation domain was, would have been a wonderful answer to helping the middle class. Unfortunately, implementation has also slowed down in recent years. But we, go, uh, we move ahead with this. Smart policies what do they look like? We currently look, and we will publish a, um, a, a toolkit on this next week, into what do policies look like for resilient supply chains. We accept at OECD that policymakers are concerned about resilience, uh, which was not the case 10 years ago, um, but uh, really look at, try to help policymakers to think about their role as one that is complementary to the private sector, but definitely not think that they should start to manage supply chains. Um, and second, we look uh, actively with colleagues in other directorates into what is, what is the new look at, uh, at industrial policies, what is happening in the industrial policy space and in the subsidization space. Um, and that's, of course, a topic that is very relevant also for trade. Yeah, absolutely. And we discussed that yesterday as well. Inflation Reduction Act, CHIPS Act, infrastructure bill in the US. But on the EU side, we have the uh, Green Deal um, and everything around us. So we also spend quite a lot. Our national governments do so as well. Um, and um, you are uh, responsible for trade, but also for agriculture. Um, and um, uh, everybody who's from Berlin remembers quite vividly, I think, um, all those tractors uh, on the streets and driving through Berlin after our government said that they would like to take away a little bit of the subsidies um, for uh, diesel. Um, so tell us a little bit about the thinking about subsidies of the OECD. Um, and, and industrial policy, when does it make sense, when does it maybe not make sense, and what is your recommendation also to our government? The, um, the interesting thing uh, in a place like the OECD that you see is that um, we now have committees like um, the committee that deals with industrial policies that is happily very active because there's this huge interest certainly in industrial policy. And, uh, when I started to work for the WTO, I couldn't even pronounce that term. We were not allowed to speak about this blasphemy. Really? Yeah, industrial policy was out. Now it's <laughs> in. Now, um, in the trade committee, talking subsidies now is difficult. And um, I'm, you may be aware or not that at the WTO in Abu Dhabi at the ministerial conference, there was an attempt to put uh, su the term subsidies or industrial policy into the declaration, the, um, uh, the ministerial declaration that failed. Mm. So it wasn't even, wasn't even it wasn't even possible to agree on any type of language making reference to this. Um, so how do we look at this uh, now at the OECD? We look at it by saying, okay, we have to look at it first. We have to look at it from three, through three lenses. There are clearly currently members, our members consider there are reasons why they want to intervene more with subsidies um, in particular sect sectors. Let's look at this. Second, we continue to believe that you have to uh, look, deal, make sure that your finances are sound, so don't start spending like crazy. Um, and third, we have to look at, or we continue to believe in international markets, so you should not distort international markets too much. Currently, um, our thinking goes into the direction that 
um, old rules like uh, first do an effectiveness analysis, what is my objective and how can I achieve it continues to be true. With the speed at which new policies are being ruled out now, I fear that that's not always done. Second, and that's interesting also for the trade discussion, in the past there was a strong belief uh, from a trade point of view that policies, spending should be designed as horizontal as possible. Don't target industries, don't target particular areas, because then you may have to choose winners, pick winners, and you may end up distorting. But from a cost-effectiveness point of view, how much return do you get for a dollar invested? It may be better to tailor and to target. So what we expect to be seeing in the coming months is a renewed debate on should industrial policy be rather horizontal or are there uh, arguments for it to be tailored and targeted? And if the latter comes through, then this requires in the follow-up a new discussion at the WTO on its subsidies agreement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and also referring to the T's, um, the good T's about <laughs> subsidies, timely, targeted, right, transformative, temporary, but the targeted is a question, right? That is the question. It's, no? it's a question. That's the one we used in particular during COVID. We focused a lot on the targeted. Um, but uh, because in COVID, you entered into a let's just spend. And that was considered not a potential ways of money. But targeted can be problematic for the WTO. Mm -hmm. And for the subsidies agreement, the existing one is not so keen on targeting. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember that um, a few years ago, there was an initiative, the trilateral on subsidies, US, Japan, um, and EU, who tabled some proposals for a well, reform of, of the subsidies and countervailing agreement in the WTO. Um, it's been a little bit more quiet about this, mm -hmm. because I think they are, I mean, we are also now spending so much, so we don't want to be actionable too much. But is there any kind of idea um, in the realm of industrial subsidies to distinguish, as with regard to agricultural subsidies, between those which would be OK, so green subsidies, and those which would be not so OK? In the, in the WTO jargon, they talk about boxes, um, amber box um, and green box and so on. Is there a discussion or willingness at all to go into that direction? I think we have changed, um, the discussion on subsidies has changed phases over the past five, uh, four or five years, and very rapidly so. The current weakness of the WTO is very much related to the subsidies topic. It was perceived by players like the United States in particular that a country like China is subsidizing heavily, but that for some reason the WTO's agreement cannot buy it. Um, and this situation is one of the reasons why the appellate body then was weakened. So the whole dispute settlement system was put into question. So a reform of the subsidies agreement is, would be a key element of the WTO reform. Now, we were moving in that direction, notably with this trilateral discussion, very much with a focus on what are we not able to capture, but what is apparently important. One of the things we noticed at the OECD with our research is that uh, China was using a lot of what we call below finance instruments, um, below market finance instruments. So things that go just through the financial systems and that you cannot capture through the typical type of notifications that the WTO uses. Um, so, but when, once we reach that stage, potentially to be ready to start talking, our own members started to use um, subsidies more and started to actively use industrial policy. So this has now put this discussion, I think, temp at halt, <laughs> hopefully only temporarily, but uh, things will not become easier. You mentioned agriculture. Do we uh, put discuss at the same time industrial policy and agricultural subsidy? That's an old question hmm. that has um, haunted the WTO for ages. Every G20 me meeting, uh, when one country mentions industrial policies, there will be another country mentioning agricultural subsidies, and, and we will also have to open that Pandora box hmm. in the future. Hmm. So um, now comes a hardball question. <laughs> agricultural policies and agricultural subsidies. Um, are, are you, as the OECD, you don't take a position, uh, generally, but are you happy with your members' policies? 
<laughs> oh, we actually do take position. We <laughs> publish every year uh, a report called uh, Monitoring Agricultural Policy Monitoring and Evaluation. So we, we hold um, the, the, the most important um, set of data on agricultural subsidies, actually covering um, 54 countries, I, I, I think, currently. So going well beyond our uh, OECD membership. Um, and the, who subsidizes a lot has changed over time. Traditionally, EU and the US were in the, in the um, absolute amounts among the biggest subsidizers. Um, China and India have grown significantly in recent years, um, so are definitely also now influencing global markets. Um, now, the way the concept of how do we measure subsidy was developed, was developed from a point of view of how can these subsidies potentially distort markets. Where um, we are not advanced enough, but are currently trying and uh, moving very rapidly in enhancing our understanding is how do these same subsidies affect environmental performance mm. or potentially distributional aspects? Um, so this brings two additional dimensions to the effect of subsidies, ideally um, looked at at the same time, not straightforward, but that's what our members are requesting. And this is what will be useful, even necessary for future discussions at the WTO, where we would probably want to look at both aspects at the same time. How, this, how potentially distortive, but what is the effect on the environment? We already made a breakthrough in that sense on fisheries. Mm -hmm. We published uh, at, the end of, at the beginning of last year a categorization of fishery subsidies into more or less um, um, effective for the sustainability or harmful for the sustainability of fishing. And we hope to come up hopefully soon, with a similar <laughs> categorization for agricultural subsidies. Thank you so much. And with this, I want to open it up for the discussion and maybe we uh, collect a few questions. Um, yes, please, the gentlemen all in the back. Um, and Hello. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, one thing that concerns uh, me quite a bit, because I have a bit of insight, is the, the unfair trade advantage of China and India and Africa uh, through corruption. Um, so we just have stand very little chances to get into mining, into rare earths, into agriculture, because we have literally no lever uh, to break the system that they have built with the Chinese and with the Indians, uh, who just move in paying the decision makers over and over again. And uh, we can stand there and complain about it, but, but nobody cares because nobody's being paid or penalized sufficiently by complaining from Europe. Um, so do you have any idea if there could probably be something like uh, a, a demand to China that we don't buy your goods if you uh, earn them by corruption in Africa or something like that? How can we break up that system? And could you also say who you are? Uh, Sandro Geiken, founder of Monarch Private Intelligence Agency. Thank you so much. We collect a few. Yes, please. Um, Günther Tau from the company TB C TBS Berlin. <coughs> Sorry. I would like to ask you how the OECD is reacting uh, regarding the concentration process um, in the cereal market. You know, Bungie, Dreyfus, Archer, and the Chinese have nearly 90% of the power there. So, um, it's a little bit, uh, we are, yesterday we were talking about the, the big tech and we have to take into account that there are big agricultural forces. And I don't know if I saw some body on that side as well. <coughs> yes, please. Galina. Thank you very much. I would like to add a question regarding climate issues. Um, as the OECD um, was one of the organizations that were asked to host the um, interim secretariat um, for the climate club of the G7 countries, of the actually 38 countries uh, that belong to the club uh, at the moment, um, can you um, share a little bit of your um, well experience or views on this? Um, is there already some kind of a progress that we do not get from media or from um, well public affairs? Um, I would like to learn a little bit more about this initiative. And with this, I hand back to you. 
Yeah, let me start with uh, the, the, the corruption um, uh, question. So we do have at the OECD an active agenda on uh, bribery. Anti uh, we, um, are, are the, we take care of the anti-bribery convention. We um, have also an active agenda on uh, um, combating illicit trade, and that work also goes into the uh, corruption space. And we work together with different organizations who fight uh, corrup corruption. So um, what has happened very recently is that that work has, is being upgraded. Uh, so the, and the illicit trade work has, uh, become, has received a different status at OECD. And it has moved um, towards the trade discussion. So it's now under uh, my responsibility. Uh, this is because we consider this to be a theme that will move, will be more actively discussed also at the World Trade Organization in the near future. So definitely, uh, pay, we are paying attention to this topic. Um, on the area of concentration of markets, this is one of the themes we look at when we deal with, um, with resilient supply chains. I mentioned the toolkit we will launch next week. Next week, we will also hold um, a conference a forum on critical supply chains um, where uh, different sectors will be discussed in terms of what is the risks of, um, of disruptions, what are the vulnerabilities in the chains. Agri-food uh, supply chains are one of the chains we look at and one of the discussions in each of these sectors will be um, are there dependencies that are such that you depend on individual producers and cannot easily switch to others. Um, so it's an area we look actively into, including for agri-food. What, however, we have uh, witnessed so far um, in the context of the Russian aggression against uh, the Ukraine is that we consider that markets had, uh, did adjust very rapidly. Um, and there was actually the OECD that uh, was the earliest, uh, the, the first voice out there in the public saying the, that the, the initial reaction, panic reaction in markets was exaggerated and prices uh, went up rapidly. We, uh, f we expected that markets, uh, based on the harvest information we had, stock information we had, that markets would be able to adjust quite rapidly, which is what happened. Um, but it's a space we watch. And, um, and increasingly so in the context of new networks and uh, new forums on the Carbon Club. So climate change in an open world Dealing with climate change in open economies, if, it, if there's one priority the OECD currently has, this is the priority. And what we need to understand there very rapidly, we need to get a better sense of the trade-offs between what does a possible policy do to distortions nationally, uh, how, how can it distort markets domest in the domestic market or internationally, versus can it be good for the environment. Um, and what do different policies do? For some reasons, some members have different views on should we use carbon prices, should we rather regulate? Um, so we have to get a technical understanding, how do policies compare, and then get members to the table and discuss how can they accept each other's policies or not. Uh, this is what happens in the context of the Carbon Club activities, but also in the context of what we call at the OECD the IFCMA, the um, Inclusive Framework for Carbon Mitigation Approaches. Um, this is a complicated name, and that reflects a bit the complication of discussions. Uh, so what we hope is that um, we can um, maintain a strong dynamic in the discussions among members, because the task um, ahead of us is not easy. I, I do expect that having initial talks among 38 countries rather than over 150 is easier. Um, but we take this aspect very seriously and we are moving rapidly and a, um, a large amount of our resources in the organization go in this direction. Mm -hmm. um, India is not one of your members. Um, I actually, I'm not sure why, why would they, why they joined, uh, not member of the OECD, yeah, yeah. no. Yeah. But uh, you see this in this inclusive framework, like the BEPS, these are um, initiatives that include many more countries than our membership. So the, uh, the tax agreement has nearly global coverage. I think the inclusive framework for carbon mitigation, it's uh, over 80 countries. Uh, the Climate Club is smaller, but it, uh, it has recently been discussed at the, G, at the G20, so it's going beyond G7 now. Mm -hmm. Are you jealous of the WTO that they do have more members than the OECD? <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, well, we are expanding, right? We are yeah. currently uh, uh, Brazil, Brazil, Peru, um, Argentina have accession discussions. Indonesia started accession discussions. Thailand expressed interest. Um, yeah, Peter, I don't know. Should I be jealous? <laughs> uh, I think in the uh, in the current context, in the current context, um, I think it's would be easier in our organization to provide a positive impetus, uh, positive momentum for many of the difficult discussions that take place. Smaller membership makes things easier. And I, it's not easy no, neither to agree within the uh, OECD, but it is somewhat easier. And we do what we can to maintain uh, momentum for a positive agenda, notwithstanding the difficult geopolitical times. Mm. So we are almost at the end of our discussion. So let me end with one last question. Um, we've been talking about the US upcoming US election quite a bit. Um, so um, a brief scenario. Let's imagine um, that uh, Donald Trump is going to win again. And um, he is going to take, um, and I don't know if you all had the chance to take a look at it, but the Heritage Foundation put together a manual of policies. Um, and the OECD is actually mentioned in it um, as one of the organizations better to get rid of, because there isn't any sense anymore of having it. And let's imagine that um, Robert Lighthouse is going to move into the USTR office again, and he is inviting you for a two-on-two -two chat. Um, should the US be a member of the OECD or not? They have second thoughts. What would you tell him? Well, I would tell him that um, the Currently, our collaboration with the United States is extraordinarily strong, in particular on the themes that are close to Mr. Trump's heart and, and, and Mr. Biden's heart also. I think the middle class is of concern to both. Um, resilience of supply chain is of concerns to both. And um, the creation of the OECD was very much part of a plan to make the United States great. And I think we can be part of the plan to maintain, to keep the United States being a great nation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Marion.